Phylum, Porifera, okay, Porifera, um, which means poor bearer. Comes from the Greek word poros, meaning poor bearer um, or passage. So sponges in Phylum Porifera have lots and lots of pores, these little tiny openings all over their body. Um, there are lots of different species of sponges. There's about 8,000 different kinds of species that we'll find, and most of them are marine, but you will have some that are in fresh water. But for the most part, they're found in marine environments. All right. So they are the pore bearers. And the pores are actually microscopic. And I'll show you what those look like. Okay. Okay. So back when sponges were first discovered, people looked at them and they thought that they were plants because a sponge is sessile, meaning it doesn't move, so it stays attached to a surface, okay? And um, if you poke a sponge, it's not going to respond, right? Uh, sponges don't have brains, they don't respond. So people thought that they were plants, non-responsive. And it wasn't until like fairly recently that we actually discovered that they're actually animals. But they're very, very different from other animals. They're asymmetrical, but also they don't have a mouth or a digestive tract. Okay, so they have no mouth where they eat stuff, and they don't have a digestive tract where the food goes through and gets digested and absorbed. So no mouth or digestive tract like other animals. And they do not have tissue layers. So sponges actually have what we call a cellular level of organization. They do not have different kinds of tissues. They only have different kinds of cells. Um, so when we look at cnidarians next cycle, you'll see they have three tissue layers, the endoderm, the ectoderm, and the mesoderm. So they actually have tissues. Sponges do not. Um, and other animals will even have organ systems. Sponges don't. Uh, but because of this, sponges actually can do something really cool. They can do um, like an extreme form of fragmentation. So if you take a sponge and you put it through a sieve or like a cheese grater and put all of the, like, all of the pieces of that sponge that get made, um, the, each of those little tiny pieces can uh, become a new sponge because they have a cellular level of organization. So, um, all right, so sponges don't have tissues or even systems to carry out the essential functions that we talked about the last time I saw you. Um, but they still have to carry out all of those essential functions like reproduction, okay, respiration, feeding, all of that stuff. How do they do it? Well, they do it with four kinds of cells. They carry out all of their essential functions with four different kinds of cells. Okay? Um, the first kind of cell that you'll find is the epidermal cell. That is the flat cell that's found on the outside of the sponge. It's like the skin of the sponge. Okay, so when you look at a sponge, what you're seeing are the epidermal cells. And your skin is your epidermis. Right? The outer layer of your skin is the epidermis. So it's like the skin of the sponge. Okay? epidermal cells. You also have pore cells, okay, where water um, is brought into the sponge. Okay, this is, these pore cells are how the sponges get their name, periphera, the little tiny opening. Um, so on our picture here on the right, okay, these little cells that look like hexagons, those are the epidermal cells, and then these pink ones, okay, those are going to be your pore cells. So water is going to enter into the sponge through those little tiny pores. Do you see that? Okay. Um, on the inside of the sponge, lining the inside, see these purple cells? Those are really cool cells called collar cells. Okay, and they have flagella and microvilli. Do you know what a flagella is? Yeah, it's like the whip-like tail. Okay. Um, so they've got flagella and microvilli. And microvilli, here's a picture, a closer picture. Okay, so microvilli are the little extensions off of the cell. So, and then here's the pink thing right there, that is the flagella, okay? So those line the inside of the sponge, okay? Um, and they beat their flagella, okay? And as they beat their flagella, they actually move the water, okay? So they move the water out of the sponge. And as they move the water out of the sponge, it creates a little bit of a vacuum and sucks water in through the pore cells onto the inside of the sponge. Does that make sense? Okay, so pulls the water in, okay, and moves the water. So the collar cells are responsible for the sponge's 
ability to move water. Um, as that water comes in, okay, the water is carrying all sorts of things like phytoplankton, <coughs> zooplankton, bacteria, dead stuff like detritus. All of that's coming into the cell, into the sponge. Okay? And those little microvilli, those little extensions off of the cell, as the water passes through there, all of those little microscopic things get caught in the microvilli. And then that collar cell engulfs those food particles and eats it. Okay, so the collar cells move the water through and then are also responsible for capturing the food for the sponge. Yes, make sense? Okay. Um, the fourth kind of cell is an amoebocyte. Okay, this picture on the bottom left, this is what an amoeba looks like. Okay, that's an amoeba. Um, an amoebocyte is an amoeba-like cell. So amoebas actually will, they're kind of like blob-like cells, and they can create these things that are called pseudopods. So see these finger-like extensions off of the cell? Um, they'll extend these pseudopods, so they'll stick out the pseudopod and then drag the rest of their body, the cell, to that pseudopod, and then stick it out and drag. And so they can move around by sticking out these pseudopods and kind of like blob-like moving over and through um, a sponge. Um, they can also engulf food this way because they can stick out two pseudopods and surround the food and capture the food okay, with those pseudopods. Uh, so the amoebocytes are pretty cool. They um, are kind of like the circulatory system of the sponge. So they pick up waste products from the cells of the sponge and they take them away and then they deliver nutrients and oxygen to the other cells of the sponge. Okay, so these amoebocytes that are moving around inside of the jelly-like interior of the sponge are delivering nutrients and oxygen and picking up waste products. Okay, um, so the amoebocytes are pretty important in um, what they do for the sponge. They also make these things that are called spicules, um, and spicules are the skeleton of the sponge. So spicules can be made out of silica or calcium carbonate. Okay, and so you'll have like these little spicules that say they look like this. Okay, um, so spicules that get created by amoebocytes, they'll be connected by protein, and then your cells will live inside of this structure. Okay, so these spicules connected and create the lattice work where all of the cells of the sponge sit inside. Okay, so this actually gives the, the sponge structure. Without these things, it would be a blob of cells on the seafloor. It would be pretty much pointless. Okay, so the spicules help to give the sponge structure. Here are pictures of spicules. Okay, so they can be made out of calcium carbonate or silica. Okay, here's some pictures of different kinds of spicules. Your salacious spicule, okay, made out of silica. Silica is glass. Okay, so you actually have a kind of sponge that's called that are called glass sponges because their spicules are made out of glass, silica. Um, there's different shapes that the spicules can be. And we'll actually, um, we actually de like decide what species a sponge is based on its spicules. So if we have an unknown sponge, you can look at the spicules and figure out what species it is. Okay, that's what we're, that's what we look at. Okay, so the sponge that I have that you're passing around. Okay, what's left of that sponge, David? is just the skeleton, okay? And that's actually made out of spongin, that sponge right there. Um, and so some sponges, their skeleton is made entirely of a protein called spongin, okay? This was, would be what it would look like under the microscope. Um, and so it's made out of spongin. Um, so that is just simply the spongin skeleton that's being passed around, okay? Um, and when you get a sea sponge, if you bring it up from the sea floor, they set it out, let it dry out, and all the cells die, and then they rinse out the cells, and you're left with the skeleton, which is what people use in the bathtub, okay? So that's just simply the skeleton of the sponge. Okay, so that's the skeleton. So water flows in, okay? So the collar cells beat, bring the water in through the pore cells, and then the water exits out through the opening at the top of the sponge, which is called the osculum, okay? It's the large opening at the top. 
a sponge will either have just one large osculum at the top or depending on the species of sponge they can have more than one okay so but that's what they look like so after the food gets brought into the sponge by the collar cells and gets captured by the collar cells it, can, it gets engulfed by the collar cells okay and then that food has two paths that it can take after that so the collar cells themselves can eat the food and then digest the food and use it themselves okay for their own energy to keep on pumping water um, or after it engulfs the food it can hand it off to an amoebocyte and the amoebocyte will digest it and then take the nutrients to another cell in the sponge's body okay so two two different um, pathways that it can take okay but basically the point of this is that all of the digestion that happens inside of a sponge is going to be intracellular okay meaning inside of the cell okay inside of a cell it's okay so intracellular, inside of a cell. Um, and notice again, no mouth, right, and no digestive tract. It's all going to just happen inside of cells. Uh, sponges have to filter an incredible amount of water to get just like a little bit of food. So they have to filter about one ton of water to get one ounce of food, okay, because the food that they're eating is that small. So one ounce would be about the size, maybe a little bit less than this Jolly Rancher right here, okay? So uh, that's how much food they get from filtering one ton of water, okay? Not very much. So they are perpetually pumping, perpetually filtering, and getting their food, okay? So that flow of water as it goes through their body is also going to be acting as their respiratory, part of their respiratory system, their excretory system, and also their circulatory system, all right? So as water comes in, it's going to bring oxygen with it into the cells of the sponge. And as it moves through the sponge, it will pick up carbon dioxide and its metabolic waste. And as it exits out the osculum, it takes it away. So it's part of the respiratory and excretory system. Um, it's also part of the circulatory system because it can pass around that oxygen and get rid of those waste products, which is the, one of the jobs of your um, circulatory system. Okay, so water exits out the osculum. All right. Okay, so that water moving through the sponge okay, will um, be one of the things that will actually determine how big a sponge can get. Okay, so sponges need energy in order to grow, just like any living thing. Um, and so, in order to get energy, they need to be able to feed and get lots of food. And the two things that will affect the amount of food that they get are their ability to pump water, how much water they can pump, and how much folding they have in their body. Okay, So it makes sense. If you are able to move more water through your body, then you are able to get more food. Right? You filter more food. Um, if for folding, okay, the higher amount of folding that you have in a sponge's body, the more um, chances that you have to get food. So Think of it like this way. Um, let's say that I'm wearing a vest that has $100 bills attached to it, okay? Um, and so I'm going to line you up in two lines, okay? And I'm going to run through the middle of you, and you'll have the opportunity to grab the $100 bills off and make money, okay? Would you rather that I lined you up in two straight lines where I can just sprint right through, or in two curvy lines where I have to then stop and pivot and stop and pivot and keep going? Number one, because I'm not very agile. And number two, do you think that would slow me down? Yeah. Okay. And would you have more opportunities to grab $100 bills if I had to go back and forth? Yeah. Same idea with the sponge. The more folding they have inside their bodies, the more chances they get to capture food, the larger they can be. All right? Does that connection make sense? Okay. So you have three different body shapes of sponges. Asconoid, that's the simplest one. Okay, that's what we've been looking at up to this point. Um, thicanoid and then leuconoid. Okay. Um, 
Sicanoid, more folding. Okay, so this is the medium-sized body plan. You'll actually look at this one today. And then the leuconoid, these are the biggest types of sponges. Um, this would be a leuconoid body um, shape. The biggest sponge ever. Gonna, well, there's um, there's sponges like vase sponges that you could probably fit in. So yeah, they're large. Sponges that you could sit in. <laughs> yes. Mermaids sit in giant clamps. Okay. Reproduction. How do sponges reproduce? Yes, with broadcast spawning. So sponges are simultaneous hermaphrodites meaning they're both male and female at the same time, okay? So um, they will produce both eggs and sperm. The eggs that will remain inside of the sponge's body, okay? And they will broadcast their sperm into the water. That's why it's called broadcast spawning, okay? They release it into the water. So they release the sperm into the water, and the water currents carry the sperm around until it gets to another sponge, okay? And uh, once it gets into the sponge, fertilizes the egg, okay, we'll create a little larva. The larva will be released into the water for a neuroplankton stage of life before it eventually settles down and grows into a new sponge. Okay, so sexual reproduction because you've got two sets of DNA that are being combined. All right. Um, so we'll talk about broadcast spawning a lot. There's lots of different kinds of animals in the ocean that will use the broadcast spawning method. Asexual reproduction, okay. sponges can do budding. So you can grow the little mini-me off their side and it can drop off and become a new sponge. Or um, they will also do fragmentation, so and extreme forms of fragmentation like we were talking about. Or they can do this form of asexual reproduction where they produce these things called gemules. Okay. What those are, is sponges will take and put a bunch of amoebocytes into this little group and they'll surround it with spicules to protect it because spicules can be sharp and then they release that into the water column and that can float around kind of like a spore and then when conditions are right or better than they were okay it'll settle down and become a new sponge but it's asexual reproduction because there's no new genetic information introduced okay ecology of sponges so what do they do? Well, sponges live in dark places, so a lot of